Gavin says we need a fly swatter up here. Well, I, uh, I don't have it in me to do what I did last week. Um, I, God has moved in my life so much as I work through that message that he gave me last week, and some of you have contacted me and responded, and, and I appreciate that. Um, John leaned over to me back there, and he said, well, he said, uh, I don't think you run anybody off. I said, that's a good thing, because I wasn't sure if I was going to have a job when I was done. Uh, but uh, it's been interesting, and it's been encouraging to me to see how many of you want to go deeper into God's word. You, you want to know what he has to say. Um, you know, and, and, and as a pastor, that's what, that's what I'm called to do is to minister to the faithful, uh, to equip the saints to do the work. And as I said in my class this morning, and if you want to learn how to read your Bible and understand it, be here at 9 o'clock on, on Sunday mornings. Uh, grab you a cup of coffee and donut. Come in and sit down with us. Bring your Bibles. Uh, and I promise you, if you'll just give me that hour each week, you're going, to, you're going to learn how to read, how to understand, how to uh, glean from God's Word. But... Um, you know, as I said to them this morning, I said, you know, it is a passion of mine to teach the Bible. I have the luxury that most of you do not, uh, and that is I have the luxury of being able to sit down and spend hours each week looking at Scripture and reading and studying, and, and uh, I have several tools at my disposal, and, uh, and I'm very, very thankful for that, and I understand um, that you all have real jobs and you have to take care of your families and time is very, very precious to you and, and you don't have that luxury. But I don't want you to, to feel like that you can use that as an excuse not to get to know your father. And the only way that you can get to know your father is through two things, prayer and learning his word, reading that love letter that he has given to us uh, to, to learn who he is. And, and actually, you know, as I said this morning, reading the Bible and studying the Bible is not rocket science. Um, you know, good night. I, Scott and I were best friends all through high school and stuff, and if he can read the Bible and understand it, good night. Any of you guys can read the Bible and understand it. <laughs> uh, I mean, he barely made it out of high school. So, <laughs> it's not difficult, though. It's really not. Uh, we believe lies that says, it's hard, I can't get it, and, and you can. Uh, the Spirit of God will reveal to you. If you desire, if you want to know what it is that your Father has to say to you, I promise you, He will meet you. He will not be silent. He will meet you and he will teach you. Um, and so utilize everything that we're doing here at VCU. Uh, that is the, the drive this year is, is the word of God. And we're, we're going to do things that, that will help that happen. Uh, I shared something with the leadership yesterday morning. I've done something. How many of you have been on Right Now Media on VCU's portion uh, this week? Have you clicked on VCU's tab? Uh, probably some of you guys that were in, in the leadership meeting yesterday and all. Um, I, man, I wish I'd have given Brandon a little bit of heads up about this. I'd love to have thrown this up on the screen. But when you go, up on, when you go on Right Now Media, I'm talking to those of you that have children, elementary age, and grandchildren that are elementary age or even high school age. I, I enjoyed it. Maybe as an adult you want to do this. 
But when you go on Right Now Media's page and you bring it up, on the left-hand side over in the library section, if you go down about a third of the way down the page, you're going to see a tab that says Viber Christian Union. Click on that. That's going to take you into a section where I put things into it. And so I've got Bible studies in there for our life groups and all. But I put something in there this week called What's in the Bible? It's kids stuff. It's a kids episode. It, they use puppets and all. Phil Vischer does this, and he's the one that does Veggie Tales and all. And I got a phone call this week and said, you need to go in and look at this, and this is some good stuff. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, we're about children. I'll go in and I'll look at this. And I clicked on this on what's in the Bible, and there's 13 volumes and every volume has two sessions, are about 30 minutes long. And they're funny, they're, you know, they're catering to children and stuff like that. But what impressed me was the depth of theology that he goes into. In the first volume, he's teaching children about the Pentateuch and the Septuagint and about the Torah. And how the and, and, and early church history and how all of this started and how all of this came about. And I was just blown away by this. And I thought, man, this is just, this is amazing. Uh, what's in here? I watched, I, I sat here and, and did a lesson on this, you know, as your pastor, as somebody that's been in the word his whole life. And I, I sat here and I've I went through this, and I watched this, and I thought, this is some great stuff. And so I've got all 13 volumes loaded into that. So go home and look at that sometime this week. Even if you're an adult and you want to look at what the Bible is about and, and become more familiar, maybe you're a new Christian and, and you've never really opened the Bible and got into it, but especially if you have children I made the comment yesterday, I said, I'm telling you what, if all of you guys will get your children into this, doing this, and watching these, and learning in these 13 volumes and stuff, plus what's happening in our gospel hour uh, with children at, from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning in children's church and stuff, Travis will be doing cartwheels in the youth center upstairs when your kids become teenagers and freshmen in high school and walk into his class. Because they will have such a well-grounded foundation uh, to, to, to learn the Bible and to be able to go deeper and teach theology and stuff. It's good stuff. Just wanted to do a commercial, and I wanted to let you know and make you aware of that. Okay. Um, if we had some time, I would love to hear publicly from some of you um, about what God has done in, in, in your life this week. Uh, in regards to last week's message. and I, Is there just one? We'll just do one. Is somebody, God has really got your attention and spoke to you. Anybody want to share anything publicly? I know some of you don't like to speak. Kathy. Really speak really loud. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It's important to me to know that you're learning, that you don't depend on me, that you don't depend on a radio program or something to, to get your Bible, um, that you're going to his word. Uh, we'll do anything we can at BCU to help you. So this week, this message this week is, is Dinah asked me, she goes, this isn't going to be like last week and all. And I said, no. I said, I'm too old for that stuff two weeks in a row. Um, but I told her, I said, it's like an addendum, if you will, to it. And I think that, that if you were here last week or if you watched this, the, the, the message on, online on the website this week, you'll make the connection. So I'm just going to trust you and the Holy Spirit to, to do that, to put that together. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and we're going to jump into this and get busy. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that I have of being able to to teach your word and, and to speak to your people, to, to, to minister to your people. Thank you so much. But, Father, I want to point them to you. I want to point them to Jesus. 
I want them to come into a love relationship with Jesus. And I want them to do that through this, through your word, through, uh, through prayer, through the movement and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Father, may we be a people that, that images Jesus. We would look like him, talk like him, walk like him, behave like him in, in everything. And most importantly, may we love like him. Help us, teach us to love. Teach us to love Jesus. And I ask this in your name. Amen. Will the real me please step forward? Right out of the gate, I want to throw up the word relational because I want you to see the meaning of it. It is concerning the way things are connected. And I want you to remember that because I'm going to use that word a couple of times in this message this morning. It is concerning how things connect, how they come together. You ever get frustrated with your thoughts, with your own personal thoughts that just seem to find their way into your mind that sometimes causes you to act out in ways that are not becoming to a Christian, that do not reflect you as a follower of Christ. You ever get frustrated with that stuff that goes on? You ever say something, do something, think something, and then you walk away kicking the dirt? It's like, why in the world do I think like I do? Why do I act like I do? What causes that? I came across a passage of Scripture this week. You know, you can say by accident, but nothing is ever by accident. Uh, I came across this passage of Scripture this week where King David said these words. He said, May my prayers be counted as incense before you. Now, what do you think he means by that? May my prayers be counted as incense before you. As I looked at that passage this week, as I'm sitting there at the table and I'm looking at this, I couldn't help but wonder what's going on in his mind. What is he thinking here? And I... I I begin to think that there's something that's going on in his life at this point that prompted him to pray this request because it seems a little strange on the surface. May my prayers be counted as incense before you. Sounds real religious, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds real churchy, almost hymnal, if you will. But yet, there's a sincerity that is in that phrase. And I want to know, I'm curious to know what prompted that request. You see, I think David, I think he wants to know that God wants to hear from him, that God actually loves to hear from him. I think David needs that affirmation in his life at this point. I think he wants to know that God really, really, really wants me to talk to him, that he wants me to communicate with him, to have communion with him as he prays. And, and I think that, that it's David's desire to know in his mind and heart that God's desire is to connect. So my question is what made David feel like he needed to ask this? Here's what I think. I think David's having some flesh issues. I think David is dealing with his flesh. I think David knows something needs to change in his life. On your outline. You see, David knows that his tendency is to drift away from the relational position that God wants him to experience. That God wants him to embrace and to know 
every day. But David knows that his tendency is to drift a little bit, to indulge the flesh too much. You see, here's what we know about David. If you study David's life, David's got a bad temper. David's got a temper problem. He gets mad. He gets angry. And sometimes he does some drastic things because he struggles with controlling his temper. We know that David tends to be a little hasty sometimes, gets in a hurry, makes choices and decisions on his own that end up causing not only him grief, but sometimes it leaves disaster behind him for other people. We know that David's got a lustful eye for women. Now, we're talking about a man that God says is a man after his own heart, but yet the boy's got a lust problem. He likes the girls. You see, David knows his flesh cannot be trusted. David knows that his flesh will lead him out of that relational position that God wants him to know and experience all the time. Not just once in a while, but all of the time. He also knows that when he drifts, he vacates a place in which he always knows peace. That he always has a sense of security and safety. Here we're coming into the Halloween season. You go into Walmart and you see all the candy, you see all the costumes, and, and kids are getting excited about dressing up in costumes and things like that. They, kids love to dress up and pretend to be somebody they're not. Little girls, they like to put on dresses and makeup and jewelry and hats and shoes and have teacups. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, I always liked to play a cowboy, a gunfighter. I had my own holster and gun. And I watched the shows. I knew how it was working. And I'd put that thing on and then I'd twist her down like this. You know why I get that gun down there low? So wherever I went, if Marlon or Monty thought they were going to jump out and get me, that was too bad for them because I could get my gun out. I love to pretend that I was a gunfighter. A sheriff, an outlaw. I'd cock that gun and just, I was tough. I'm still tough. <laughs> I loved pretending. But pretending to be somebody else when you're a kid, that's fine. That's okay. But when you carry that into adulthood, and you pretend to be somebody that you really ain't, that's not good. So I'm going to ask the question, it's on your outline, am I being real or just pretending? Ask that question. Am I being real or just pretending? You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a follower of Jesus. Am I real Or am I just pretending? You know, last week I said something that I did not mean to be hurtful, but I said something that I felt necessary to say, and that is that I'm not even sure half of you are saved, that half of you are Christians, that half of you. You might be a church tender. You might be a member of this church. You might teach a class. You might uh, serve on a team. You, you might be faithful to give and, and all of that, but... None of those things mean that you're truly, genuinely a follower of Jesus, a truly, genuinely a, a Christian. You may be living a lie. You may be deceived. You may have all kinds of Bible knowledge. Are you pretending? Is Jesus real? Are you in love with him? 
Do you think of him every day? Do you desire to follow him every day? Because you see a real, true, genuine believer, follower of Jesus Christ is consumed with Jesus. There's a problem that seems to be indicative of the reputation of the church today. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, look at what John says here. He says, see what kind of love, what a lavish love that God the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And look at this next line, and so we are. That's exactly what we are. The reason why the world doesn't know us, doesn't want anything to do with us, criticizes us, persecutes us, isolates us, or ostracizes us is because they don't know him. They don't understand why we do what we do, why we live like we live, why we, are, 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 we think about the things that we think about. The problem in the church today, guys, is hypocrisy. A lot of Christians struggle with being real in their walk with Christ. And the reason is, is because they tend to indulge their flesh, they think in their flesh, they act in their flesh, they read their Bibles in their flesh, and therefore, the words that are coming out of their mouth is, I'm a Christian, but what everybody at work sees, what everybody at school sees, what everybody in the family sees what the neighbors see is something that does not line up with what they say. Who is the real me? Will that person please step forward? Or have they already done so? Or have they already done so? So many Christians compartmentalize their faith. They put it away. They, they, they've got a box for it. You know, we all know about men and their boxes. But men and women do this. They take their faith and then they put it on the shelf. They put it in a compartment. And they'll pull it out when they need it. They, they go to it when they want it or they need it or when it's convenient for them. So they, you know, they compartmentalize their faith. And, and so what they're doing is they're putting this facade on at times, depending on where they are and who they're around and what they're doing, as to what they look like. You know, it's amazing how a guy can clean up his language at church or around certain people, but put him on a job site, put him on an assembly line, put him at work in an office, and whoo, the vocabulary is completely, entirely different than what it is in Sunday school class. That's a fake. That's a facade. You say, well, I, I, got, I just got a weakness. It's just, it's an issue of my flesh. No, it's a lack of love and respect for who you represent as an ambassador. I went to a Sporting KC game last night with, with Gavin and Travis, and I tell you what, in the name of Jesus, I'm about ready to knock a drunk out behind me. Because he was dropping the F-bomb just about every 60 seconds. And I'm thinking... What's it going to look like in the morning if I'm in jail and they don't have anybody to stand on the stage and preach this message about the love of Jesus because I would laid this drunk out? It's amazing. Depending on the circumstance and the situation we're in, how we act. You know, now some of you would have been surprised if I'd have gotten arrested for punching that guy last night. Some of you wouldn't have been, you know. That's the part that scares me as your pastor. 
But it's amazing that changed the environment, put me in a different place, and guess what? I pretend. Or am I pretending? In the real place where I ought to be. You know, if you were to ask unchurched people, and th- this is what Chip Ingram d- talks about in our, in our Titus study, in our life group, you know, in his introduction. If you would ask unchurched people why they don't attend church, why they're not interested in Christianity, they're going to tell you it's because of the hypocrisy of you and me. On your outline, unchurched people aren't interested in Christianity because it doesn't seem to bring any real change in people's lives. It doesn't seem to affect them. You know, I've said at sporting events, and witness people that I know attend church on a regular basis, maybe serve in leadership, sometimes go to my church, act in ways that are nowhere in any shape or form becoming to the image of Christ. Are we pretending when we're in church, when we're around Christian people? Unchurched people never, ever, ever going to be attracted to Jesus that claim to be religious and yet live hypocritical lifestyles. Now, the reality is, no matter what we do, even if Jesus himself came and lived among some people, they would never turn to Jesus. Some people aren't coming to Christ ever. Some people are never going to be affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a blindness. There is a a lack of sensitivity to the moving of the Holy Spirit. They're not coming. So it doesn't matter what you do. They're not going to be affected by your behavior one way or the other. They, They don't care. But there are people around us. God has placed people in all of our lives, in our sphere of influence, that genuinely want to see what a true follower of Jesus looks like. Not some religious pretense, a genuine follower of Jesus because they're looking for that. They're looking for something that's real, something that's true. I get frustrated with the hypocrisy that I see in my own life with how I often let the flesh affect me. I, that's why I related to David this week in this passage of Scripture. It's why my mind went where it went. Was he struggling with some flesh? Was he battling and dealing with some issues in his life? And he knew there was a problem. There needed to be something in his behavior that would reflect his prayer life so that God would be pleased with his prayers. You... Remember what Jesus said. I used this last week back in in John chapter 12, verse 26. It said, if a person truly wants to serve me and follow me, then where I am, my servant will be also. Well, I looked at that again this week, and I couldn't help but wonder if sometimes, you know, where it talks about Jesus saying, if you really want to serve me, if you really want to follow me, then you will be where I am. You know, Jesus ain't going to go where we're at. You know, he's not going to follow us around. You know, that's what a lot of people have that concept of in, 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 as Christianity. Lord, go with me today. Bless me today. Take care of this for me today. God, do this for me today. Go with me, Jesus. Go with me. Go with me. There ain't nothing in the Bible that says that Jesus has any desire to go with us. Nothing. Think about that when you're praying. Think about that when you're singing. Think about that when you're, when you're reading Scripture. Jesus never says, I'll go with you. I'll go where you go. Just hold my hand, carry me along with you. I'll just bless your kingdom. He doesn't teach that. He doesn't preach that. He doesn't press that. He says, listen, if you want to be my servant, if you really truly do love me, then follow me. Come on, let's go do some stuff. Let's, I'm going to show you things you ain't never seen. I mean, beyond your imagination, you're going to be involved in stuff. There's going to be a difference made for the Father and for his kingdom. Come with me. Follow me. Follow me. And so I look at that passage, there will my servant be also, but because of the way I behave sometimes in my flesh, 
Sometimes I think we're in situations where the Lord would look at me and he would say, you know what, I really wish you'd stayed home today. I really wish you weren't here right now because I'm trying to do something in this person's life and you're getting in the way. You ever feel like that? You ever wonder maybe if Jesus might be saying that to you, boy, I wish you'd stayed at the house. Hypocrisy's killing us, guys. It's killing us in our, in our credibility and our witness to our families. It's killing us in our credibility and our witness to our communities and to those that we work with and, 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 and those around us all the time. We, hypocrisy's killing the witness, the testimony, and the credibility of our faith, of our testimony. I think here's the problem with many of us faith. Look at your outline, guys. Within the church, there seems to be at times no relational effect for those who profess to be followers of Jesus. No relational effect. If we're in a relationship, a loving relationship with him, there should be a relational effect. But often there's not. Ask yourself, go back to your outline. Can people identify me as a follower of Christ by my behavior away from the church? Can people identify me as a follower of Christ when I'm nowhere close to the church or around other Christian people? You know how you act at work, you know how you act at school. You know the way you are at home. You know what you're watching on TV. You know what you're reading. You know what you're, you know where you're going. You know who you're hanging with. You know all the words that are coming out of your mouth. Could they identify you as a follower of Jesus? You've heard me say this before. If you, if Jesus is not Lord of all then he's not Lord at all. Write that down in your notes, please. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. As I read this text this week, and I'm going to read you the whole text, not just verse 2, but the whole text. David must have been wrestling with his own hypocrisy and failures in regards to his relationship with the Lord. It's in Psalm chapter 141. That's where I found this at. In Psalm 141, we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 5. And it says, O Lord, I will call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. And, and, and let my prayer be counted as incense before you. You know what incense do. You light it and it, it, it creates an aroma and, and the smoke rises up. And he says, you know, let my prayers be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity. And let me not eat of their delicacies. And let a righteous man strike me. Let a righteous man strike me. Because it's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is all for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. Now, in verse 2, which I started out with, incense were used in the temple. And David was referencing that visual in his prayer. And they were used in the temple as a symbol of the sweetness of prayers. That we were in the holies of holies and, and, and the incense were lit and, the, and the, the smoke would rise. And it was to visualize as their prayers, as they prayed, their prayers would go up to the Father, up to God. David wanted the Lord to be pleased with his offering. He wanted the Lord to be pleased with his prayer time. Now, 
think about that. Uh, some of you don't pray hardly ever unless you're in trouble. And then others, when you pray, it's just a very quick bullet point checklist. Boom, 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 got it done. Others of you go to pray and you just sit there. And then the next thing, you know, you're thinking about the car or you're thinking about the lawn or you're thinking about the laundry or you're, you're thinking about work or you're thinking about the football game or and you go, oh, just give it up. And you just, David wanted his prayers to matter. He wanted his prayers to mean something. He wanted his prayers to reflect his heart. He wanted God to be pleased with his behavior. I thought about this passage and I realized how much that I wanted my life to honor God. I want to know at the end of my life, when I have no more breath, that my life will have been a testimony for Christ, that as a son, my life honors him. As I said last night, I, I got the opportunity to go to the Sporting KC game with Travis and Gavin and with Kobe. So I'm there with my sons. I'm, I'm there with my offspring, my legacy. Um, and they're the only guys that are there with me. You know, and I thought about how my sons honor me. My grandsons honor me. They always watch out for me. They, I think they think I'm getting old. I think they think I'm not as tough as I used to be. And I can't do all this stuff anymore. Because they, I, I catch them more and more saying, oh, let me do that. Hang on. Even Kobe's doing it now. Papa, hang on, I'll get that. There's just an honoring. I think, I think they would rather take a beating than, than speak ill towards me or to disrespect me. I think they'd rather take a beating than that. And I love that. And it makes me wonder and desire, as David, does God see that in me? Am I a man that in what I say, what I do, my speech, my actions, my deeds, and everything, does he see me as a son that honors him? And even beyond that, do others see me as a son that honors my father? I tried to imagine what David could have been a thinking, and I, and I put this on your outline. Was David concerned that his prayers had become a stench to God rather than a sweet aroma? That when he prayed that God said... Why bother? Or maybe, maybe David's behavior, on your outline again, guys, maybe David's behavior didn't line up with the prayers that he is offering. I, well, I don't know what was going on in David's head, but maybe this was what he was thinking. Do you ever, do you ever feel like that the Lord closes his ears to you that he just you ever feel that way I'm wondering if David wasn't starting to feel this way maybe David was thinking I don't know if you're listening to me dad I don't know if you're listening to me I wonder if sometimes he says or maybe would have us to, to reply to, to understand him this way, it's on the screen. When you're ready to get real, you come see me. Otherwise, you do what you want because you will anyway. I wonder if David was at that place and thinking, maybe that's the way the Lord is thinking of me. Maybe that's, 
that I've indulged my flesh so much that I've been such a, a pretense here that he's just not listening to me. You see, the prophets of Israel were always teaching and instructing their people that the prayers and the lives of their people needed to be in harmony with one another or God would reject their prayers. Stop robbing from me if you want me to bless you. Stop worshiping idols if you want me to honor you. He was saying, listen, stop coming in and worshiping me with your lips when your hearts are far from me. And the prophets were teaching the people, listen, if you want God to hear your prayers, your life needs to be aligned with him and, his, and what he is asking of you, what he is calling to, of you. And when the life does not line up parallel with the prayers, God will no longer hear. And they taught them this. They told them this. And David, I'm thinking, had come to a place in his life when he knew my behavior does not line up with my prayers. Had the Lord revealed something to David, much like what he had revealed to Isaiah? You go to Isaiah chapter 62, pick it up in verse 2, and it says, I open my arms to who? My own people. All day long. But they rebel. They, they follow their own evil paths and thoughts. All day they insult me to my face by doing what? Worshiping idols, chasing their tails in the world. Going after every little thing that's supposed to bring some kind of sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. They just chase it and chase it and chase it and chase it and exhaust themselves and spend their money and spend their time and they go after these idols. They do this in their sacred gardens. They burn incense on the rooftops of their homes. At night they go out among the graves and the secret places to worship the evil spirits. They think they're getting away with something. They do it in the darkness. They do it where nobody will watch them. Nobody can see them. They also, they eat pork and, and other forbidden foods. In other words, they're just consuming everything around them that is detrimental to their lives and to their families. And yet they say to each other, don't come too close to me because you'll defile me because I'm holier than thou. See, I go to church all the time. I give on a regular basis. I serve. Listen to what he says. He says, there is stench in my nostrils, an acid smell that never goes away. You know what stands out to me, though, in that whole passage is who he's talking to. He says, to my people, to those who bear my name. They're the ones that's become bitter to him. They're the ones that are smelling the place up. I wonder how many coworkers would say that about you. <laughs> In regards to God, you're smelling a place up, man. How many classmates might say you're smelling a place up? The things that he says here, such as worshiping idols, can refer to anything that takes precedence, guys. Anything that takes precedence in our lives, such as materialism, time, activity, secret places. They can refer to the way we hide our sinful behavior so nobody sees it, so nobody knows, so nobody catches us. Things that we would be ashamed if people found out about. And yet in spite of that behavior, that attitude, the way that we live, we pretend we're holy. And we sing and we raise our hands and we 
love the songs and the music and the society of the church and we pretend that we're decent. We pretend that we love Jesus. In reality, we really love ourselves. That's why we behave like we do. I'm going to ask a question. It ain't the first time I've asked you this question, so it may be very familiar. But how many times do you come to church, do your thing each week the same way, and leave here unchanged and unaffected? If you've truly opened your heart and your mind to, to the Word of God, you can't leave unchanged. You cannot leave unaffected. Could we be guilty of just simply doing church rather than being the church? Being the body of Christ? It's easy to do church. Good night. Anybody can do church. Whole different thing to be the church, though. Because you don't start being the church until you get in a car and leave. I'm going to ask you three questions. And wind this thing up. Is our lives marked with the same love for people that Jesus had? Is our lives marked with the same love that Jesus had for people? Are the decisions that we make concerning our personal lives driven by the love that we have for Jesus? Or are they done out of selfishness for our own desires? And is hypocrisy a characteristic of our lives that other people would identify us by? They like us. Hey, they think we're a great guy. They think we're a great girl. But if they were to be honest, they'd say, yeah, you're a hypocrite. I know you go to church. I know that you claim to be a Christian, but you're, you're a hypocrite. I love you, but you're a hypocrite. Would that be what they would say? You know, we throw on this costume of Christianity when it's appropriate, and then, man, we can jerk it off really fast when it's inappropriate or or when it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable. You know, when Jesus walked into the world 2,000-plus years ago, he drew a line in the spiritual landscape and... uh, You know what's been going on in the lives of Christian people is we've been jumping back and forth across that line ever since. The thing that's criminal of the church today is that we're sending a terribly, terribly confusing message to the people around us. All of us have a responsibility to those who God has placed in our sphere of influence, a responsibility to introduce the gospel message of Jesus. But the problem is most of us have no credibility. I think David realized his own hypocrisy because of something that he says in this prayer. He says, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. How many of us need to pray that? Set a guard over my mouth. I can't help but wonder how many times our mouths turn people away from Jesus. See, words are powerful. They're powerful for building people up, but they are even more powerful in tearing them down. On your outline, you know, we will never be effective for Christ until we are able to show the love of Christ through our words. We'll never be effective for him until we can love like him. And that begins with the words that come out of our mouths. David goes on and he says something else that I think is easily related to as well. He's concerned about how often 
he behaves like the world. He says, let not my heart be drawn to what is evil to take part, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are lost, who don't know Jesus. Let me not eat of the delicacies that they eat of. Let me not consume those things. He's concerned, David is concerned about drifting back into the behavior of the world in which he's come out of. Are there things in this world that we as Christians can enjoy? Absolutely. This, the world was created for man. It's created for us. And as Paul says, that God has given us all things to enjoy, but he didn't give us anything to control us. He didn't give us anything that we should worship. He didn't give us anything that, that should consume us. Many things in this life that we have the privilege of enjoying. I live life large. I love life. I love the life that God has given me. I am eternally and forever grateful for the privileges that I know in life. But they mean nothing without Jesus. And I work consistently in my spirit not to let them mean more to me than they should. What I do with Christ is more important than what he gives me and what he entrusts to me. I'm going to ask you one, another question. Is your love for Jesus strong enough to cause any significant changes in your behavior? One of the greatest privileges of being a part of the family of God is other believers that love you enough to gently and lovingly speak truth into your life. It's the greatest blessing that any of us possess is to have a brother or sister that loves us so much that they will come to us and they will say, you got to do something different here, man. You got to stop this. You know what the word says. Listen to what David said. said, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's, it's oil on my head. My head will not refuse that. You know what his son Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 27, 6? He said, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm not talking about somebody wants to criticize you and somebody wants to hurt you. I'm talking about somebody that loves you. And they love you enough, they will not let you be where you are. And if you're digging a hole, they'll come to take the shovel away. Not because they're holier than you. Not because they can hear from God better than you can. They just love you. And this is what we ought to be to one another. We ought to love each other so much that we're not afraid of offending because we love, we care. We speak the truth. But we do it in love. As John Maxwell says, no one care, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And if they know you care, they'll hear you. Other people know if we're genuine or not in regards to our faith in Christ. And I love those who are willing to speak truth to me in love and show me grace. But Christ has already spoken truth to us in his word. We ought not to need that brother or sister speaking truth into our lives because God's word has already done it. And if we truly love Christ, we're going to see it. I'm going to ask you, 
when you hear the truth in regards to your hypocrisy, are you willing to accept it? What was it that Jesus says? What do we see in Scripture? Let him who has ears hear. You willing to hear it? I'm going to close with two questions. One, how do other people evaluate you? How do other people evaluate you? And number two, are you keeping someone from really seeing who Jesus is? Are you keeping someone from really seeing who Jesus is? It might be your children. It might be your grandchildren. So here's your takeaway. Remember the passage of scripture we read, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Or chapter 3, verse 1. Because I'm a child of God, and that we are, will the real me step forward? Romans 1, verse 16, walk out of here with this verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning because hypocrisy is a huge issue in our lives. We often, too often, allow the flesh to, to reveal itself and to show itself. And we send that confusing message to people as to who we really are. We really are your children. We really are our child of the king. We really are an ambassador for Christ. We really have been given that same message of reconciliation that to, to give to others. We really have been given that message. We must, we must carry that message with credibility and with integrity. Put a guard over our mouths. Take away from us the desires to mingle with those who are lost by participating in their conduct and their activities. Either draw them to us because of their search for you or send them away from us. But may there be a change. Father, we want to look like Jesus, not because it's the religious thing to do, not because it's the responsible thing to do, but because we love him. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's that we lack love for your son, Jesus. Help us. Forgive us. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Remember, you have a connection card in the pocket, seat pocket in front of you. If you're a visitor, please put your